Sometimes, getting home from downtown Pittsburgh is just a bridge too far. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Launch. On the night of January 23rd, 2017, 23-year-old Dakota James was out drinking with some of his buddies from work. Dakota was a second-year Master of Business Administration student at Duquesne University, and he worked in logistics at a local trucking company. On the night in question, Dakota was out with co-workers from that trucking company, just doing a little bit of bar hopping, when he decided he was going to head home around 11.30 p.m. And what should have been a very simple, easy walk across the Roberto Clemente Bridge over to the North Shore actually ended up being a complete mystery that would take the entire city of Pittsburgh by storm and leave them very confused, not just for a few months, but to this very day. But before we get into the topic of the video, this content, what I want to do is introduce you to our partner for this video, Opera. We all spend a lot of time on the internet these days, it is clearly how you're watching me right now, and at this point, it is essentially my job. When you spend so much time online, it's very important that your browser can give you the best possible experience. And the best web browser I've been able to find is this week's sponsor, Opera. Opera is a unique web browser that comes with a whole bunch of features that just make sense. That includes an ad blocker to streamline your web browsing experience and load pages faster, top-of-the-line security features to give you peace of mind, and one of my personal favorite features when I have just a million tabs open, Tab Islands. As I've mentioned in the past, I have to do a lot of research for these videos, and that research means I often have dozens and dozens of tabs open at once. Being able to organize my research using the Tab Islands feature is simply a game changer. The enhanced organization not only keeps my ADD addled brain sane, but also saves me time every single day, which I increasingly have less and less of. In addition to all of that, Opera also includes Aria, a free AI generative tool right there on your browser. Using Aria to translate and summarize old forum posts and web pages really helps when researching more obscure topics, and having it right there is just incredibly convenient. If you're interested in giving Opera a try, head on down to the link below and take your browsing experience to the next level by downloading Opera for free. You can even migrate your data from whatever other browser you were using, so it really is hassle-free. So I just want to say thank you to Opera for sponsoring this video, and now back to the story. And of course, when I say story, this is a Lore Lodge video, which means I'm going to include a quick little history segment. If you're not interested in that, I totally understand, and you can simply skip on over to the next chapter of the video. First settled by Europeans in the 18th century, the city of Pittsburgh sits at the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers where they become the Ohio. And in the years leading up to the time when French explorer Robert LaSalle would go and make his way down into this little corner of Pennsylvania, that was the land of the Shawnee people. Like many other Algonquin-speaking peoples, the Shawnee have a migration story which tells of them coming to the mainland from a place across the sea, some sort of island. In some versions, they come across on a turtle. In other versions, they come across on a boat. However, unlike the Algonquin-speaking Anishinaabe cultures to their north, the Shawnee don't really have a story about traveling down the St. Lawrence River. Instead, their story just kind of has them coming to the south, generally. Now, it could be that they had initially come with the Anishinaabe and shared that migration pattern with them, but after going through the Niagara area, they may have just decided to settle on the mainland. We know this is possible because that Anishinaabe story does involve tribes splitting off and settling along the way to Lake Michigan. Their society had five main tribal divisions, according to James Findlay, a Methodist minister who spent a lot of time amongst the Wyandot peoples, which brought him in contact with people like the Shawnee. And along with this five-tribe system, the Wyandot author William Connolly says that they had 12 further clans within that structure. These clans were the rabbit, raccoon, panther, turtle, wolf, deer, turkey, snake, bear, wildcat, eagle, and owl clans. But perhaps most interesting is that this migration legend actually involves encountering Europeans. According to Chief Charles Blue Jacket, way back in the ancient past, there was a prophecy that a serpent would emerge from the sea and it would bring death and destruction to the people. And Blue Jacket went on to say that when his ancestors saw the whipping pennants atop the European ships, they knew that the serpent had come because the pennant looked like a forked serpent's tongue. Thing is, when I was reading through that, it made me wonder something. Because if the Shawnee are from that same group as the Anishinaabe cultures, there's a possibility that that story was garbled somewhere along the way. Because, while it could definitely be that those pennants appeared to be serpents' tongues, we also know that the Norse, 
who arrived in Newfoundland around 1000 AD had ships that would have dragons or serpents on the front of them. In addition to that, we also know that the Norse, pre-Christianization, had a legend about how the world would end partially due to a giant serpent. So part of me does wonder if this is not preserving a 500-year-old story, but rather a 1,000-year-old story, which could be very interesting in the grand scheme of things. In either case, whether the beginning of the end was heralded by the Norse, the French, or the English, it arguably came at the hands of the Iroquois. While the European powers would eventually conquer the entirety of America and set up the two nations that would become America and Canada, the Iroquois were actually kicking the Shawnee around throughout much of the 17th century. So, by the time of French exploration of the area, the Shawnee population there had dwindled to near nothing, and most of them had just gone elsewhere. That made it very easy for the English to come in and build Fort Prince George, and also very easy for the French to come in, displace the English, and build Fort Duquesne basically right on top of it. And that made it really easy for the British to come back in and build Fort Pitt like 300 feet away in 1759. Fort Pitt would then cement itself in the history books during Pontiac's Rebellion in 1763. During that year, a force of Native American warriors led by the Lenape appeared outside of Fort Pitt, and the militia only really had time to prepare because, ironically, a few Shawnee told them to. On the one hand, the colonial forces lacked the men to go out and face the natives in open combat, and on the other hand, the natives lacked the ability to break through and take the fort by storm. This led to a series of negotiations, and during those negotiations, one of the commanders of the militia, a man by the name of William Trent, came up with a newfangled idea. Or, not technically newfangled in the sense that biological warfare had been around for a very long time. More, nobody had really tried to give people smallpox on purpose before. The fort itself had actually just experienced a smallpox wave, so they had a whole bunch of blankets and handkerchiefs and whatnot that had been used on troops who themselves were infected with smallpox. So, Trent organized to have two blankets as well as a handkerchief from these infected people given over to the Lenape as sort of a sign of goodwill. Realistically, however, and based upon Trent's own writings, the goal was not to tell the Lenape, hey, we respect you as warriors, but instead to cause a smallpox epidemic in their camp. It should be noted that William Trent did this without asking High Command if it was okay. They had no idea that he was going on this mission. Thankfully for the Lenape, the Europeans and Americans hadn't really yet figured out germ theory, so they weren't aware that smallpox, in fact, needs a living human host to transmit itself. If you've seen our video on the Tuskegee experiment, that kind of goes through the history of when medical science went from being complete guesswork to an actual scientific field. So thankfully for the Lenape, smallpox did not spread through their camp because it was dead by the time it arrived, and thankfully for the militia, they were relieved not long after. Pontiac's Rebellion then ended in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which banned American settlement beyond the Appalachian Mountains. We've talked about it to some extent before, but this was a very important contributing factor in why many of the southern states joined the Revolutionary War. With the proclamation, however, that land was still technically owned by the Iroquois, who sold it to the Penn family in 1768. With that, Fort Pitt became part of the colony of Pennsylvania, and then itself would be instrumental in the Revolution ten years later. Shortly after the war, in 1784, the village of Pittsburgh was founded outside of the fort, and over the next 200 years, it would grow to become what it is today. That being the second largest city in Philadelphia, with about 300,000 residents, and the home of two major universities, namely the University of Pittsburgh and Duquesne University. And as I said before, it was at Duquesne University that Dakota James was studying for his MBA. Now, as we said at the beginning of the video, on the night of January 23rd, 2017, 23-year-old Dakota James and several co-workers were out bar hopping. Then, around 11.30 p.m., Dakota decided that he was going to head home because it was 11.30 p.m. and he had work the next morning. He walked part of the way from their last location that night with a female co-worker, who then got into an Uber around the Wood Street Transit Station, which sits at an intersection with Liberty Avenue. After that, closed-circuit TV cameras caught Dakota walking off towards the north, and then that's about it. Nobody saw or heard from Dakota for the rest of the evening or the next morning. And then when Dakota didn't show up for work, his boss called his apartment complex and somebody went to look for him there. And when nobody could find Dakota by Friday morning, the apartment decided they were gonna call his parents in their hometown of Frederick, Maryland. Pamela and Jeff James then attempted to file a missing persons report with the Pittsburgh Police Department, describing their son as being 5'8", 140 pounds, and having pierced ears as well as a triangle tattoo on his inner left ankle. Those were all of his identifying characteristics. Part of the problem was that the police told them they needed to wait 24 hours after they realized he was missing in order to file a police report, something that is just blanket not true. 
If you've seen our video on the Brandon Swanson case, you may be familiar with the fact that there was actually a law passed in Minnesota back in 2009 to get rid of this myth that you have to wait to file a missing persons report. It used to be that police departments had some level of discretion about when they would accept a missing persons report, whereas Brandon's law, at least within Minnesota, made it so that you couldn't wait. The moment that report was filed, the police had to take it up. And the thing is, while the law was originally passed in Minnesota, it very quickly spread throughout the entire country. By 2017, there was no way that a police department in the state of Pennsylvania would be able to tell you, no, you have to wait 24 hours without being in violation of the law or simply lying to you. So while Dakota had in fact been missing since the night of the 25th, there was no police response until the night of the 28th. At that point, the police put out a call for public assistance, and by February 4th, there were searches being organized for Dakota. However, the efforts were really heavily split between volunteer and professional. In many of the cases we've discussed, the professionals lead the search, but they heavily lean on volunteers in order to carry out the tasks necessary. In this case, Pam James, Dakota's mother, actually had to go to the media and tell them that the police weren't doing anything. They weren't communicating, they weren't telling her what they had, they weren't saying if they had any sort of footage, any evidence of Dakota from that evening, they were just boxing her out. The article in which she kind of just railed against the cops for the way they were handling the case came out on February 6th, so naturally on February 7th, once it became a problem for them, the Pittsburgh Police Department went and they actually released some information, which basically just amounted to a single still from a CCTV camera showing Dakota walking. It was timestamped at 11.49 p.m. January 25th, 2017, and it showed him walking northwest through Katz Plaza. I went and I used Google to do a little street view and was able to ascertain that he was heading towards Scott Place. Yeah, Scott Place, which is an alley that leads you over to the highway. Thing is, after Dakota passed by that CCTV camera, it appears that he just simply vanished. Obviously, this wasn't enough to tell anybody anything except that Dakota had been headed towards his home that night. So, needing more information and accepting that perhaps there could be some reason to suspect that something had happened to Dakota and he wasn't just kind of chilling somewhere else. They requested a search warrant, it was granted, and they looked through at least one of his social media accounts. But they found nothing of interest. Or at least if they did, it wasn't shared with the public. What they failed to find was something that the Smiley Face Killers team from the Oxygen Network, but more importantly from the Smiley Face Killers theory, actually did uncover, and that was that there had been a singular PayPal transaction about 48 hours after Dakota went missing on his PayPal account. The problem is that the only place this information has ever turned up was on the Smiley Face Killers TV show, and they wouldn't say what the charge was for. So, looking at it, I wonder, was this actually somebody actively purchasing something? Was this a recurring subscription? Was this his easy pass? You know, there's a number of possibilities that could look like something other than somebody was using Dakota's account. And just to clear it up, we will be addressing the entire Smiley Face Killers thing in one video, so we're doing all of the cases so we can thoroughly research every single one and then put all of it together to do an analysis like we did with Missing 411. So that's why in this video you're not going to see a ton of analysis that is directly related to their theory. In this case, we're just sticking with the specific facts, what is known, not what is sort of conjectured, and we're going to form our own conclusions. Still, by that weekend, Dakota hadn't been found, so large organized search parties, essentially surges of volunteers taking advantage of the weekends, formed on the 11th and 18th of February. As this was happening, the police maintained that there was no evidence whatsoever that Dakota was a victim of foul play. The thing is, in my opinion, that's not really true, and they should have known it wasn't true because of stuff that they were told. Both Dakota's mother, as well as a 35-year-old female friend of his who went by her last name of Shelley for anonymity purposes, told the media that there had been a strange incident involving Dakota in mid-December of 2016, just six weeks earlier. And while Dakota's mother had simply been told about it, Shelley herself was an eyewitness. She had been there. According to her, Dakota had called her in a panic late in the evening of December 16th, 2016, telling her that he was cold, he was scared, and the police wouldn't help him. And it's clear that he was disoriented because while he was telling Shelley, I'm on the north side, he in fact showed on his location services that he was on the south side at a Spring Hill Suites on Water Street. As for why Shelley would have Dakota's location, apparently she had driven him to the airport a few months earlier, so this was just 
a holdover from that. Before anybody gets into speculating about what his relationship with Shelly may have been, this is where Dakota breaks from the general smiley face killer's narrative in one way. Unlike most of the others, Dakota's gay. So chances are, Dakota, who according to his family simply just got along better with older people, was just friends with a 35-year-old woman. And if I'm remembering correctly, they were co-workers. It also might be important, but I'm not sure how to interpret this, that prior to Shelly checking his location, she had asked where he was, and he just sent her a picture of a leg with jeans and said, I'm here. And then she sent back a question mark, and Dakota responded by saying, please help me, I'm so cold and the cops won't help me. According to Shelly, Dakota had told her, eventually, that he went up to a police officer and asked for help, only to be told no. Now, Dakota had called her around 11.15 p.m., and she arrived at the Spring Hill Suites just 15 minutes later at 11.30. When she arrived, however, she saw Dakota walking out of the hotel towards a dark color SUV, sitting the wrong way in the wrong lane. She says she pulled up about 10 feet from the SUV, leaned out the window, and yelled Dakota's name, at which point he kind of like turned around, looked at her, looked back at the SUV, and then walked over to her car and got in. When Dakota got into her car, Shelly noticed that he was still crying, still appeared very shaken up, and while he didn't seem like he was necessarily drunk, considering how emotional he was, she wanted to get him to talk about it, but when Dakota refused, she respected that he simply wasn't in the mood to discuss, and maybe she would get the answers later. All he could bring himself to tell her that night is that he had been out and about at the bars, and then he became aware that he was walking down a street, didn't know where he was, didn't know how he got there. He last recalled being at a work party on the north side at 7.15 p.m., and then he woke up, while still, of course, being up and about, just came to his senses on the south side four hours later. Fifteen minutes later, once Shelly arrived, she wanted to take him to the hospital, fearing that he had been drugged or perhaps assaulted, but he refused and said, I just want to go home. Dakota did end up just going home and getting back to normal, and apparently he seemed perfectly okay after the incident, but, in my opinion, whether this was connected or not, that's enough that the police should have probably looked into considering this something more than an accidental drowning. They should have at least investigated the possibility of kidnapping or, even worse, homicide. But, as they were unwilling to look into that possibility and without any further evidence to go on, all people could do was look, and that's what they did for a couple more weeks, using air searches, ground searches, and even dive teams in the rivers near where Dakota had been seen but nobody could find a trace of Dakota above or below the waterline. Then, a glimmer of something that could be called hope came on the 22nd of February, when Tutti's famous Italian beef called 911 after receiving a message on Yelp. In the message, somebody claiming to be Dakota James said that they were being held in the basement of an address in Shaler Township to the northeast of Pittsburgh, and that they'd been kidnapped from the north side. Police followed up, but they claimed they found no evidence that Dakota was ever there. And they were probably right about that, because the bridges that Dakota could have crossed have cameras on them, and not one camera caught Dakota on any of the three bridges. Then, a couple of weeks later, on the morning of March 6th, a woman by the name of Debbie Domlo saw something floating in the Ohio River. About 30 feet offshore, near the I-79 bridge over the Ohio River, and south of Neville Island, they discovered the body of Dakota James. A full 40 days had passed since Dakota was last seen, and the police quickly ruled this to be an accidental drowning to the utter shock of Dakota's parents. And the James family weren't wrong to suspect foul play, or at least want more of an investigation, because this case is a lot more complicated than the police were letting on. Clues in either direction were pretty scant, so the police made the argument that Dakota had crossed Fort Duquesne Boulevard, walked to the Roberto Clemente Bridge, descended the stairs, and then went to relieve himself in the river, at which point he fell in. After just a few minutes in the frigid Allegheny River, which at that time of year averages about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, he would have entered shock and he would have simply been gone. And of course, in their version of events, he fell in because he was just beyond hammered. There was no, it was just, it was so likely, that was the most likely outcome was, ah, this guy probably went to pee in the river and fell in. Thing is, when Dakota was recovered, he had a BAC of just 0.214, and because the blood alcohol level in the body will go up after drowning deaths, and it will continue to go up the longer the body is in the water, it's entirely possible that Dakota was under just two times the legal limit. The only way that anybody could possibly tell how truly disoriented Dakota would have been, because again, we, we 
everyone's different when they drink. Blood alcohol content alone is really just a good indicator. It's not going to tell you the exact nature of somebody's behaviors. The only way that we could tell how unsteady on his feet Dakota would have been would be if the police released more CCTV footage, and they simply refused to do that. Additionally, whether or not Dakota even died that specific night is in question, because of a few factors, such as the state of decomposition, the state of his body itself, and the similarity of this case to other accidental drownings in the Pittsburgh area. You see, when Dakota was pulled from the water after spending allegedly 40 days in it, his body was remarkably well-preserved. When interviewed by Anthony Duarte of the Smiley Face Killers team back in 2018, the Swiftwater response team that recovered Dakota's body claimed his facial features looked like what we saw on TV for the last month. It may also be important to note that when they discovered Dakota's body, it was actually face up in the water, which is not usually how dead bodies float. At least, that's if they drowned. Usually, if you drown, once the gases start to build up in your body, you will come up and you'll be flo floating face down in the water like this. That said, it is not impossible for a drowning victim to end up face up in the water. It's just not what you typically expect to see. What I'm more focused on here is that they said his face looked the way his face looked on TV, which was when he was alive. Whereas the medical examiner's report lists his decomposition level as moderate, which would suggest bloating, blackening of the skin, skin slippage, and some other general nastiness that it really didn't look like Dakota necessarily had. I also thought I might have seen liver mortis spots on his back, which they should not be if he drowned, but I couldn't tell there was one singular picture available. Based on the very limited autopsy photos and report available via the various channels I had, it doesn't look to me like Dakota is 40 days into decomposing. He looks like if he is to be listed as moderate, he would be in the much earlier stages of that. And as we know from the Todd Guide case that we covered, a human body can completely decompose in water in just 20 days, let alone 40. This was displayed in the study run by Dr. Eric Benbow, which used pig carcasses to track how long a body decomposes in warm, still water. But that's the thing. Dakota was not in warm, still water. He was in cold, flowing water. As I said, the Allegheny, the Ohio, the Monongahela in this area average in the 40s during the winter months. And that is definitely cold enough to significantly slow the growth of bacteria and thus the decomposition process. And we know what kind of effect even just cool water, let alone cold water, can have on decomposition from the Luke Homan and other La Crosse, Wisconsin cases that we covered. Essentially, if Dakota had remained submerged for most of the time he was in the river, it could slow decomposition enough that he would appear the way he did when they found him. Obviously, the big question here is, could Dakota have remained submerged for that long, for a full 40 days? Because, as we saw with the Luke Homan and other La Crosse, Wisconsin cases, Bodies in cool water tend to float to the surface after just five days to a week. Even with the slowed decomposition, Dakota should have gotten to the surface earlier. Now, closely connected to this question of could his body look like that after 40 days in the water is the question of could his body look like that after 40 days in the Ohio River. What I mean by that is could his body have no post-mortem injuries after traveling 10 miles down the Ohio River? Most importantly, could it have no post-mortem injuries after going through a steel and concrete dam, as it did, or is alleged to have done? The Emsworth Dam, the one he would have passed through, operates using submerged gates that were open only 18 to 24 inches on the morning that Dakota was discovered. That meant it was very unlikely that Dakota's body could have passed through without sustaining any damage. But that's if it came through that day because if it came through earlier, say on the 1st, well, the gates were open up to 7 feet that day, which means he could have done that and been without a scratch. If he had gone through on the 1st when the gates were open 7 feet, however, one would expect him to be a lot further along than just 2 miles past the dam as he was. Given the speed of the current, assuming he didn't get stuck on anything underwater after going through the dam, he should have been far beyond Pittsburgh at that point. He should have been well downriver. So if he wasn't well downriver and the gate was only open 18 inches the morning that he was discovered, chances are he didn't go through the dam at all. And according to the Swiftwater response team, Dakota's body wasn't just in good condition. A team member named Kiso said that out of the more than a dozen bodies he had pulled from the river in his time, this one was in the best shape of all of them. 
The Smiley Face Killers team also asked, does this look like a body that went in by the Roberto Clemente Bridge, through the dam, and ended up down here in the condition that it was in? To which Kiso responded, I think the condition is consistent with a body that didn't travel that far. Additionally, there is a spot on Neville Island where somebody could easily drive a car right up to the water line and dump a body into it, and that spot is beneath the dam. It is below the dam further downriver. There's also the issue of the medical examiner's report, which, while not publicly available, was reviewed by the Smiley Face Killers team, and they took issue with the fact that it lists no antemortem, that is, pre-death, external or internal visible injuries. They brought the autopsy photos that had been shared with them by the DA to Dr. Cyril Wecht, who is a renowned forensic pathologist. He has also served as a coroner in his past. When he looked at the photos, he determined that there was absolutely evidence of foul play, and more specifically, there was evidence of a very obvious external injury. Looking at a set of red markings on the back of Dakota's neck, Dr. Wecht came to a conclusion. He said, they are strongly suggestive and entirely consistent with a ligature having been applied around the neck. This death may have been due to ligature strangulation. And a ligature is a rope, a tie, anything used to bind something or tie something off. In addition, he said he saw distinct difference in the coloration of the fingernail beds of the fourth and fifth fingers on both the left and right hand consistent with somebody fighting against ligature strangulation. Basically, if somebody had wrapped a rope or a cord or something around his neck and he was trying to pull it away like this. For that reason, Wecht argued that this should not have been listed as an accidental death, but as an undetermined manner of death, or even further, possibly a homicide. Now, you might be wondering, what was the medical examiner's reasoning for saying this was not a ligature strangulation? The medical examiner claimed that there was dried blood on the back of Dakota's neck that he had simply washed off. And there is allegedly a second picture that was not shared by the Smiley Face Killers team, which shows Dakota without that red mark. Until one or the other party releases both photos so that people can compare, it's going to be really hard to tell who's telling the truth. However, all of this leads me to ask the question, how is it that a body spends 40 days in running water? and still has superficial blood on the neck. Unfortunately, little more can be said or done for the physical evidence because, at the request of Dakota's parents, his body was cremated. So all we can really go on is what else we happen to know about that night. Dakota was seen at three different bars on the night of January 25th, 2017. He and a female co-worker went to Diamond Market Bar & Grill, then they left there for 941 Saloon at 9.27 p.m., and from there they went to Images Bar. The female co-worker that he was hanging out with was somewhat new to the company, and as far as anyone can tell, it seems that Dakota was kind of just befriending her and showing her the ropes. So we should look at a couple of things about this evening, at least up until he leaves the bars, which is that those second two bars he went to were both gay bars, and Dakota being openly gay and these being well-known as gay bars, that makes sense. We also know that the bartenders at the latter two, 941 Saloon and Images, both told police that Dakota had been asked to leave because of his behavior. I can say, having worked as a bouncer in two different Pennsylvania towns, you might ask somebody to leave for reasons other than intoxication. Sometimes somebody's just being an asshole and you gotta ask them to go. So I didn't always kick people out because they were too drunk. Sometimes they just were not fitting the vibe. Say somebody just gets angry and throws a bottle at somebody, but they're dead sober? Out. You're making girls uncomfortable because you don't know when to take no for an answer? Out. That said, it very well could be that Dakota was drunk and he was kicked out because he was too drunk. So the best way to tell precisely why it is that Dakota was kicked out, what his behavior was, beyond hoping the bartenders remember well enough, would be using interior footage from these bars. And while they did have interior security cameras, by the time police requested the footage, it had been recorded over. The police said that this wasn't a problem because Dakota had gone missing outside and they could put together enough information about what happened inside from witness statements, and it probably didn't matter what was on the film anyway, because he went missing outdoors. Now, I vehemently disagree with this, and in my personal opinion, the police said that it didn't matter what he was doing indoors and what those security cameras may have caught, because they simply failed to act quickly enough to get their hands on the footage. You see, Dakota was first reported missing on a Friday. He had gone missing on a Wednesday, and the police did not get to it because they said his parents needed to wait 24 hours. 
until Sunday. And I say I disagree with their statement that it doesn't matter what went on inside of the bar, because it could be that those cameras caught some sort of altercation, a disagreement, some sort of interaction, where the people who Dakota was in whatever kerfuffle he was in with decided to follow him out of the bar. From there, they could have stalked him to the alley, ambushed him while he was in there, and taken him away to God knows where. Once again, if the police were to release the 30 minutes before and after Dakota walked through Katz Plaza, it would probably help people ascertain if he was followed. The police, of course, claim that they saw nothing to suggest he was, but I don't know when we started just taking people's word for things. In academia, when you write a paper and you make a claim, a whole bunch of other professors rip you apart in every possible way for every little minute detail you got wrong. Yet when the police are involved, we just kind of have to take their word for it. This is especially relevant in the Dakota James case, because as we know, just six weeks prior to him going missing, he was involved in that strange incident where it appeared that he was either drugged while at the bar, or possibly went through a short dissociative fugue state. Fugues are not always to the level of somebody like Danny Philippitis or Stephen Kabaki, who we covered in another video. Sometimes they last only a few hours rather than several weeks or even months. In fact, most frequently, when somebody is in a fugue state, it only lasts a short period of time, and often people don't even realize it's happened, and the people around them may not realize it's happened. For those who don't know, a fugue is where somebody goes into a... Uh, a, a mental state where they are still active, they are still kind of performing normal tasks. For the most part, anyone around them would think that they're fine, except then they wake up and they don't remember any of it. You would only really notice if somebody was in a fugue state if they were that way for more than a day and you started to notice that they were really off. Otherwise, it might just look like they were kind of having a bad day or they were a little bit out of it, maybe they didn't sleep well. Now, as for fugue states, there's not really a consensus around a known cause. The thing that most people sort of look at is traumatic brain injuries, but there's there's people who have had fugue states who did not have a traumatic brain injury, so nobody's really sure. It does seem more frequent in people with TBIs, though. Danny Philippitis, for example, was skiing when he went into his fugue state, so it's possible that he hit his head. And they believed that he had a concussion, and that's what caused it. In the case of Dakota James, however, that SUV that was parked outside of the hotel that he was in leads me to have questions. Was he possibly drugged? Was this intended to be some sort of kidnapping? Again, it's it's weird that he made it all the way into the hotel and then didn't they didn't kidnap him before he got there, but he also didn't tell Shelly everything that had happened that night. She said that it seemed like he was holding something back. So there could be a detail, something that happened that night, that maybe Dakota didn't feel comfortable sharing. Maybe he didn't wake up, so to speak, on the street. Maybe he woke up in the hotel. Regardless of precisely what happened, it's unclear whether or not it was connected to what happened that night. We just know that something weird had happened to Dakota earlier that year. There's also the fact that Dakota was gay and left well-known gay bars that night. And while Pittsburgh isn't known for homophobic hate crimes, and the entire state of Pennsylvania only had five hate crimes related to sexuality occurring in all of 2020, it is a possibility. The reason I use 2020 is because that's the data I could find. I couldn't find it for 2017. It was probably out there, but 2020 seemed near enough. In case you're wondering, there were more than that in 2021 and then even more than that in 2022. But also, if you look at all of the, the hate crimes, they all go up a little bit over the last three years. It seems like people were a little too busy having COVID in 2020 to be doing hate crimes at the rate they were previously. So there, there were probably a few more hate crimes in 2017 than 20... I should have just looked it up. And you want to look up how many uh, hate crimes there were in 2017 in Pennsylvania, specifically sexuality related? Okay, I just had Aiden look it up and he couldn't find anything before 2020 either. He also may have been followed out of images as a result of whatever his quote-unquote behavior was, stalked until he said goodbye to his female friend who would be a witness, and then something could have happened to him. It's really hard to tell because the police are keeping everything so incredibly close to the vest. And when we look at where Dakota went missing, the specifics of their theory that he just went to the Roberto Clemente Bridge and then fell into the water, well, Dakota wasn't captured on any of the cameras either at the entrance to the bridge or on the bridge. So their theory that that's what he did is pure conjecture based on that single still or whatever other footage they got from Katz Plaza. That is, unless there's something else that they have, something else that they know, that they're just not telling people. 
And then there's the issue of the DA, who took a meeting with Pamela James, the, the mother of Dakota James, in 2018 to review the evidence compiled by the Smiley Face Killers team. This is a rare case amongst the Smiley Face Killers documentary series, where the investigation was so recent to the Smiley Face Killers TV show shoot, that they were able to just kind of go in while it was sort of going on. What makes that meeting with the DA interesting is that, according to Pamela James, there was an FBI agent and a Secret Service agent there as well, that they were already in the room when she walked in to meet with the DA. That's weird, because the FBI and the Secret Service, the Secret Service is, an, is a whole other animal here, but the FBI, at the very least, does not investigate missing persons cases unless the missing person is a minor, taken across state lines, thought to be a victim of organized crime, or thought to be a victim of a serial killer. As for the Secret Service, they typically don't get involved in missing persons cases unless the missing person is a member of the presidential or vice presidential family, or in some very specific cases, they will look into missing minors. And then the other possibility is that for some reason the DA thought that Dakota James went missing because of counterfeiting, which is the other thing the Secret Service does. Since Dakota was not a minor, was not taken across state lines, and uh, was not a member of the presidential or vice presidential families, nor was there any reason to think that he was involved in counterfeiting, the only remaining possibility for why there would be an FBI agent there is if they thought that there was organized crime or a serial killer. That's weird, because the Pittsburgh Police Department has been adamant and has directly refuted claims that there is a serial killer at work here. The FBI, meanwhile, has adamantly refuted claims, going back to 2008 at least, that the smiley face killers is anything more than a bunch of coincidences and accidental drownings. And of the more than 100 cases that have been challenged by Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, only one has resulted in a change from accidental drowning to homicide. Now, that's not necessarily going to speak to the quality of Gannon and Duarte's work, because... As we know, we've looked at a few of these now, and there's no way that Todd Guy accidentally drowned, and the La Crosse, Wisconsin murders, or accidental drownings, definitely seem to have a pattern if you remove, I'd say, half of the people, and you just look at five of the ten. And you may be saying, well, that's kind of cherry-picking, isn't it? Well, no, I'm saying that only five of these people look like they were victims of one specific killer. The others do genuinely seem to be accidents. The connections between those five, however, are very distinct. So while that is not a smoking gun to say that the cops are definitely hiding something, it does lead me to believe that, at the very least, the DA suspects that either there is a serial killer or organized crime at work, or that the smiley face killer theory has some degree of merit. And because I don't think he thinks it has any degree of merit, I'm gonna go ahead and say that my guess is that they think that this is a serial killer or organized crime, or at least they are open to the possibility while telling the residents of Pittsburgh it's impossible. Really quickly, to explain why I don't think the smiley face killers are relevant here, there was a smiley face found under the I-79 bridge, where Dakota James was eventually located, but smiley faces are such an incredibly common piece of graffiti that I don't see any reason to believe that that would be a, an important piece here. Additionally, they found 11 smiley faces under the Roberto Clemente bridge, and they could not say for certain when any of these smiley faces went up. If they had gone up after Dakota James went missing, then you might be able to make an argument, but they couldn't actually do that. That leads us into the question of why might the DA think that this could be a serial killer? Well, as it turns out, Dakota James was neither the first nor the last young man to go missing and turn up in the Ohio River in Pittsburgh over the last 10 years. Or, I guess more accurately, in the 2010s and beyond. There are actually five cases that bear a lot of similarity to one another. Dakota James, Jimmy Slack, Paul Kochu, Thomas Hughes, and Brandon Pfeiffer Davis. Jimmy Slack went missing on December 6th, 2011, and was found January 23rd, 2012. Paul Kochu went missing December 16th, 2014, and was found March 26th, 2015. Thomas Hughes went missing January 23rd, 2021, and was found April 16th of the same year. And Brandon Pfeiffer Davis went missing March 24th of 2023, and was recovered May 11th of 2023. And I'm about to go into detail on each case, but really quickly, all five men were found in one of the three rivers running through Pittsburgh, primarily the Ohio. All of them were white men in their early or mid-twenties, they all had short hair, and they were either clean-shaven or had short-trim beards, and they were all between 5'8 and 6'2". 
In addition, all three were last seen within two blocks of the Three Rivers Heritage Trail, and then they were not recovered for between one and four months. All except for Thomas Hughes had been at bars or venues that night and were known to be intoxicated at the time of their disappearance. Starting with the first of them, Jimmy Slack was last seen at stage AE on December 6, 2011. He separated from his friends at 9.30 p.m., spoke to them at 1 a.m. when he told them he was still partying, and then spoke to them again on the phone at 3 a.m., telling them that he thought he was going to go home. His body was recovered January 3rd in the Ohio River, complete with his clothes, his wallet, his cell phone, and his ID. The assumption was that he had fallen into the river and he had just drowned because he was inebriated. And his family was okay with that. They, they said they're okay with this being an accident. But... While I respect that the family may feel that way, it is my job to ask the question, does that make sense? The first thing that popped into my head when I was looking at it is how close Jimmy's body was to where he had gone missing in the first place. His last known location was stage AE on the North Shore. That is very close to the Three Rivers Heritage Trail, and you could pretty easily just walk south and end up falling into the river for some reason or another. The weird thing to me is that when Jimmy's body was discovered, it was only a half a mile away after spending six weeks in the Ohio River. And it wasn't found by any of the 68,400 people who would have been leaving Heinz Field, which is now Akershire Stadium, after either of the two Pittsburgh Steelers home games that occurred during the time period when Jimmy Slack's body was allegedly just floating in the river 100 feet south of them. Instead, it was found by a RiverQuest tour boat pulling up to dock. And the weird part about that to me is considering RiverQuest tour boats would have been running multiple times throughout this six-week period, how is it that nobody else saw him? And it gets even weirder because the spot where he was found had had not only bloodhounds, but also cadaver dogs walk past it on numerous occasions, as well as just larger search teams looking for Jimmy Slack. But with nothing else to go on besides the fact that Jimmy had disappeared and then showed up in the river, and with, at that point, no real history of young men accidentally drowning in the river, they just assumed it was an accident. And then, almost exactly three years later, 22-year-old ICU nurse Paul Kochu went missing on December 16th, 2014. That night, he had gone out with friends to a bar called The Library, which was on East Carson Street on the south side. Sometime around 8 p.m., they left the library to head over to Smokey Joe's so they could watch the Bears lose to the Saints. And this bar was about four blocks from their home. Just to be clear, he was out with his roommates that night, as well as a couple of other friends, and he and all of his roommates were recent graduates from Duquesne, and they were all nurses. Sometime before the football game ended, Paul simply told his friends that he was feeling a little too drunk, or at least that's what they reported. He probably could have said anything along the lines of, I'm not feeling good, I'm going to go home. But he allegedly told them he was starting to feel a little too drunk and he was going to walk home to their apartment on the 2100 block of Wharton Street. Sometime after that, he texted his roommates to tell them that he had sliced his hand open, at which point they went home. But when they got there, according to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette's Michael Fuoco, they ended up in a bit of an altercation with a now very drunk and very combative Paul. During this altercation, Paul ended up getting shoved into a wall, leaving a dent, and while his roommates claim his head did not hit the wall, it's hard to say for sure. After this point, he became extremely emotional and began to cry, and then after that, he became combative yet again. Now, when I read through this, the first thing that occurred to me was that this, this sounds like Paul was drugged. And when you look at people's statements about what Paul was usually like when he was drunk, they said he was never physically combative. One thing that might make a drunk person physically combative is being slipped benzodiazepines. But there's also other drugs that would do this that might be slipped into somebody's drink at a bar. I'm just familiar with benzodiazepines as I was prescribed them for a while, and we also covered the Aaron Hedges case where, when he was withdrawing from alcohol, but also drinking alcohol while on his trip. He was on benzos for the purpose of uh, treating the anxiety that comes with alcohol withdrawal, and as a result, he became combative. So that, that was what stuck out to me there. But that night, because his friends simply didn't want to deal with whatever was going on with him, it didn't occur to them that he might be drugged, they decided that they were just going to leave, they were going to give him some time to cool down, and they would come home. So around 2.20, they left to go to McDonald's came home at 2.30 a.m., and from what they saw, Paul was not there. They assumed he'd gone to bed, they went to bed, and it only became clear to them the next morning, when Paul was not in his room and neither were his belongings, that he probably wasn't there. 
they called Paul's brother, who called his family to ask around if anybody had heard from Paul, and when nobody had, his family called 911 and reported him missing. A search was launched, and it included dogs, divers, boats, professional and volunteer groups, ground crews, the whole nine yards, but no sign of Paul could be found. Then, about two weeks into the search, police managed to scrounge up some CCTV footage from down the street, which appeared to show a man with something white wrapped around his hand, holding it close to him, and walking strangely. His gait was off, as if he was in pain. And it caught him passing the Giant Eagle supermarket, which has an entrance on Wharton Street, as he walked down the 1900 block of that road to the west. What was interesting here is that that was captured at 2.47 a.m. Would not have taken him 17 minutes to walk from the 2100 block to the 1900 block. So, people began to wonder, did his roommates actually know something? Was there more to this story than they had let on? The roommates, however, when speaking to police, were adamant that they had that everything they had said was true. And the police just kind of took that, and, and I, I really don't know why. My point in saying that is that it is very possible that his roommates know what actually happened to him. But if they are telling the truth, it calls more things into question. One aspect of this is that a former FBI agent by the name of Larry Liker reviewed the footage and determined that, in his opinion, it seemed that Paul was more hurt than just his hand. That it seemed like he was in pain in multiple places, like he had been beaten up, not just cut himself. However, without examining Paul, nobody could know. So, for months, the case was just kind of at a standstill, until Paul's body did turn up in the Ohio River in Wheeling, West Virginia, a full 47 miles away from his last known location as the crow flies. That's 90 miles in the river. And he showed up a full four months later. He'd have to have gone through the same set of dams that Dakota James allegedly went through, and then he'd have to go through several more dams. You can tack on to all of this that when he was recovered, he was completely nude except for a wristwatch with a rubber band. When the medical examiner took a look at Dakota's body, they determined that the cause of death was freshwater drowning, while the manner of death they listed as undetermined. And this could be because there were injuries on Paul's body that they could not account for. For example, he had three fractured ribs. Along with the broken ribs, he also had a one inch long wound to his scalp, but the medical examiner could not tell if these were pre- or post-mortem injuries. Additionally, all of Paul's roommates were nurses, so had the altercation when he got all combative from being drunk resulted in him breaking his ribs, they certainly would have known. So the question that I have for this, just because it doesn't make sense to me that they would have killed him on purpose, is did they say that this altercation happened before they went to McDonald's, when in reality it had happened when they got home, and they were just trying to mask that so that it didn't look so bad for them if something bad did happen to him. Because they may have realized, they may have known, he was more hurt than just the cut on his hand. They may have realized that he had broken ribs. And they may have known that if he went out that night drunk with broken ribs and a hand bleeding as it was, something very bad could have happened to him and it could have legally ended up being their fault. So when I look at this, my assumption based on the evidence available is that if they did lie to police, they probably did so not because they had killed Paul and thrown him into the river, but because they were worried their actions had led to Paul's death. And part of the reason I say that is because they spoke to police and gave the police their story before Paul's body was recovered. So who knows really what happened here. If they didn't directly cause his death, then there are still further questions to be answered. For example, the medical examiner said it was completely possible that the river could have removed all of Paul's clothing by the time he was recovered. Dr. Cyril Wecht also reviewed Paul's case, and what he determined, looking at the evidence, was that it was unlikely the river would manage to remove all of Paul's clothing. So while the medical examiner said that that was possible, Wecht disagrees. When Paul's body was recovered, they did test his blood alcohol content, and it came up as a 0.15. As we've discussed, blood alcohol content will elevate after death if you die and remain in water, so he was actually even less inebriated than we thought. While his BAC at recovery was basically twice the legal limit, he could have been much closer to the legal limit. So, because of that, a lot of people doubt that Paul would have just simply fallen into the river. And since there was no reason to believe that Paul would choose to end his own life, that really only left one possible option. But 
homicide has never been proven. Seven years after Paul's death, another young man, a 25-year-old who was 6 foot 1, 260 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes by the name of Thomas Hughes, also disappeared. And not only did he disappear near the river, but he disappeared just two blocks from where Paul Kochu was last seen. Thomas was in a steady relationship with a girlfriend who had been a longtime friend, and he was content with his job, he was basically taking on a surrogate father role, and Reagan Ruff, the girlfriend, had said afterwards that he had recently come to her and said how nice it was that when he came home at the end of the day, her three kids were so excited to see him. That weekend, Thomas and Reagan were actually in from out of town. He was visiting his parents, whereas he and Reagan lived together in Ridgeway, which is up in northwestern Pennsylvania. On January 23rd, 2021, Thomas and Reagan were visiting Thomas's family, and they were at his sister's house in the Beechwood neighborhood of Pittsburgh. That neighborhood is well off from the river, and a very large Appalachian ridge stands between the neighborhood and the south side of Pittsburgh. As far as the events of that night go, everything seems normal until after dinner, when halfway through his first beer, Thomas abruptly went upstairs into the bathroom and locked himself away in there for one or two hours until approximately 10.15 p.m., at which point he ran down the stairs and before leaving, looked at his father and said, why can't you trust me just once? After that, he got into his 2012 Volkswagen Rutan, which is a minivan, and he just sped away. Sensing that something was very clearly wrong, and this being wildly out of character for Thomas, they immediately called 911 and reported him missing, and it seems that the Pittsburgh Police Department got the memo after the Dakota James thing because they immediately sprung into action. As the police launched their search, Thomas's family also hit the road so that they could drive all over Pittsburgh trying to figure out where he would have gone. Problem, of course, being Pittsburgh's not a small city, and there are a lot of places he could have been. So it took about a day and a half for anybody to figure out where he may have been, which in this case came in the form of finding his car, and it was parked on the side of 18th Street near that road's entrance to the Three Rivers Heritage Trail. The keys were still in the ignition, and nothing had been taken from the car. On February 4th, it's not clear precisely when they obtained this footage, but on February 4th, the police then released a CCTV camera feed that showed Thomas Hughes walking through a convenience store somewhere in Pittsburgh on the north side. In fact, Brighton Road. And they wouldn't disclose the exact location, but from taking a look around Google Maps, it was probably the Circle K on Brighton Road. I say that because the only information available was that it was on Brighton Road and it was a gas station. There's only like one gas station on Brighton Road. They also were able to acquire footage from the traffic cameras of him driving his car later that night, once going through the 10th and Carson intersection, and the next one of him turning off of East Carson Street onto 18th Street, and that was at 3.38 a.m. So at that point, he had been out and about in Pittsburgh for five and a half hours, and nobody knows what he was doing. Nobody could come forward and say, yeah, I saw him. It was just total blank. Once again, searches by land, by air, and by river turned up nothing at all about Thomas Hughes' whereabouts. And then four months later, his body was found in the Ohio. Except this time, it was all the way in Manaka, which is 26 miles from where his car was. This also meant he would have had to go through the same set of dams and locks as both Dakota James and Paul Kochu. Now, I will say, the, the real reason that those dams and locks are relevant is related to the state of the body when it was discovered. The only one I could find where there was an actual description of what the body looked like was Dakota James. It could be that Paul Kochu, as well as Thomas Hughes, both showed signs that they had gone through the dam and had post-mortem injuries. As we know, Paul Kochu had broken ribs, which could have come from him hitting the dam. They also could have come from something else in the water hitting him, or that could have been from the fight that happened on land. With Thomas, I was unable to find any description of the state of his body. Also, it was so much later. He was in the water for a full four months. I also could not find a specifically listed cause of death, but I also could not find anything suggesting that they had ruled it a homicide, so I'm assuming they ruled this either undetermined or as suicide. In this case, Thomas is the one that sticks out to me where I'm like, that could have easily been suicide, given the outburst towards his father and then the driving around for five hours and the fact that he got out of his car and parked it near the trail. He also had told friends that he was feeling a little depressed lately, and while feeling depressed does not necessarily mean somebody is feeling suicidal, it's more likely that you're going to see that kind of thing happen with somebody who has expressed depressive feelings. But if that is what it was, if he chose to end his own life by going into the water, my question is why did he get out of the car there? 
if he planned to jump into the river, why cross over two bridges, drive all the way to the south side, and then park his car half a mile from the nearest bridge pedestrian entrance? If we look at where he ended up parking, the nearest bridge that he can get to not only has a pedestrian entrance on East Carson Street, but it also has a parking lot. Also, don't quote me on East Carson, it might be Wharton. But the point is, why park on the side of some random road instead of parking in the parking lot? It could be that he was trying to hide what was going on, but what's the point of that under the circumstances? I'm not saying it can't have happened, I'm just asking if that's likely. And if he chose not to go the bridge route, if he just decided to jump into the freezing river, why? Because that is so much worse of a way to go than jumping. And then finally, there is Brandon Pfeiffer Davis, who was a 22-year-old, 5 foot, 10 inch tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Greenfield resident who was last seen at McFadden's, which is a bar on the North Shore, on March 24th, 2023. The last thing that Brandon Pfeiffer Davis was known to have done was leave McFadden's that night and try to call an Uber. After that point, he just seems to vanish. Searchers combed every possible inch of shoreline they could looking for Brandon, with his grandfather leading the effort. According to him, if they came to a thick patch of brush, they cut through it. If they came to an obstacle, they knocked it down. They were not letting a single stone go unturned. Unfortunately, Brandon's body was discovered on May 11th, 2023, on the shoreline of Neville Island, just next to the Neville Chemical Company. And once again, his body was beyond the Emsworth Locks and Dam. And this is another case where I was unable to find any articles suggesting that this death was ruled to be either a homicide or undetermined. So my assumption is that they ruled this an accidental drowning or a, a death by suicide, basically. As for the state of his body, the level of decomposition, there, there was nothing available. And I am interested because clearly the water would be warmer in March through May, so I do wonder if we had the chance to look at how decomposed he was, if that would tell us anything about the other cases that happened in the winter. However, there's just nothing else that can really be said because so little is publicly available about any of these cases. So, when we go to do our analysis, we're gonna be re requesting, through the Freedom of Information Act, we're gonna be requesting autopsy reports, police reports, on everything. Just at the pace we do these videos, we typically don't have time to complete and receive the documents from a FOIA request. So, in a few months, when we've gone through a bunch of these cases and we feel prepared to do the meta-analysis, we will actually be requesting FOIA documents. With that said, we now have looked at five cases, not just Dakota James, but four other similar ones, and I want to take you through what connections there are between them. In my opinion, there's, there's definitely a certain pattern. All of these men were white, between 22 and 25 years old, disappeared after dark, were last known to be by the Three Rivers Heritage Trail, and were recovered from the Ohio River two to four months after going missing. In one case, it was six weeks. Beyond that, Jimmy Slack, Dakota James, Paul Kochu, and Brandon Pfeiffer Davis all shared the following traits. They were drinking at bars that night, they were single so far as I could tell, they had not expressed feeling depressed or suicidal, and they were on foot. Leaving out Jimmy Slack, Brandon, Dakota, Paul, and Thomas all had to pass through that dam, but of course that's only really relevant if all of their bodies lacked any sign of physical trauma. Paul, of course, does not lack physical trauma, we just don't know when the physical trauma occurred. If we could find out if it occurred that night, which I'll admit the CCTV footage sh showing that he was walking strangely, would suggest that he received the rib injuries that night. But, like I said, this is only relevant if all four have no post-mortem injuries. And there is, of course, one more connective tissue here that applies to four out of the five, and that is that Jimmy Slack, Dakota James, Thomas Hughes, and Brandon Pfeiffer Davis all had to cross a bridge to get home that night. So, taking an honest look at everything that I came across as I was researching for this case, I do think that there is connective tissue. I do see ways in which each of these deaths seem like they had enough things in common, that it is at least worth looking at a homicide possibility. That said, I think that there is a lot less to connect these cases than, for example, the Luke Homan and other Lacrosse, Wisconsin cases. Looking at those cases, those men were all drinking not just on the same side of town, not just on the same road, they were on the same block before they went missing. And, as far as where they went into the river, it seems like it was the same location every time, Riverside Park. 
In this case, it's the Three Rivers Heritage Trail, but that kind of traces all the way along the shoreline of all three sides of town. So I don't think there's any smoking gun, these cases aren't necessarily connected, and they're not necessarily homicides. But I do think there is enough here, enough unanswered questions, enough high strangeness with, for example, the state of the bodies and when they would have been able to go through a dam and whatnot, that a further investigation, a reinvestigation of these not as individual deaths, but as possibly a connected string of murders, I do think that's worth investigating. With that said, I see no reason to believe that the whole smiley face killers thing has anything to do with this case, or at least that the graffitied smiley faces are connected. Now, do I think it's possible that there are copycat murderers out and about? Yes. I think that is a lot more likely than serial killing being responsible for all of these cases across the US or organized crime. If we're looking at, for example, across Wisconsin as the genesis of this series of events, then I think it's more likely that you have either a serial killer who moved on from La Crosse, Wisconsin, or a set of copycats. Based on how many of these there are and the variation in location, I'm leaning towards copycat, essentially if these are actually connected. Which again, not gonna say they are, just trying to look at the evidence. Now, with this specific set of cases in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania between 2011 and 2023, with the knowledge that there was an FBI agent present at the meeting between the DA and Pamela James, I do have to wonder a couple of things. First of all, are they genuinely considering that this may be a serial killer? And second, is this something that Pittsburgh residents need to be concerned about right now? Because unlike the La Crosse, Wisconsin cases, the, the most recent of these was 2023. I understand that it is easier for the FBI to look for a serial killer when the public is not aware that there is a serial killer out and about. But on the other hand, I think it's important for the public to be aware if there's a serial killer out and about. Of course, it could very well be that all of these were accidents and that the evidence exists to prove that they were accidents. But until the police are willing to work with private investigators and the media and journalists and everybody who can kind of devote resources they don't have to it, it's gonna be very hard to get the public to trust them. The police need to be forthcoming, they need to be transparent, and in my opinion, for the most part, local police forces, when these kinds of things happen, have bitten off more than they can chew when they start to investigate them. That's why the FBI gets involved. It's because they have resources that these guys don't. But even the FBI has its limits, and something that could fill those gaps would be sharing relevant case information with private entities, with private groups like us, like the media, who can devote more time to it. And I'm not saying that that's what it should be the moment somebody goes missing, but when you're looking at almost 10 years since Paul Kochu disappeared and no understanding of what happened, in my opinion, that's when you start to maybe give out what you know. So with all of that said, obviously, you know, lots of information here. You guys on many occasions have given us stuff that we didn't know about in the past. So if you have thoughts on this case of our coverage, any of that, please let us know. We will work any corrections into future coverage. We will follow up on any leads that you give us. And we do actually read the comment sections. So if you want to help us out, if you want to criticize us, if you have comments, suggestions, please let us know in the comments below. And if you would like to support what we do here at this channel, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for just $1 a month. You can also become a YouTube channel member for $5 a month. Or you can check out our coffee, which is from Tableau Roasting Company. I designed it myself. It is very good if, if I can brag a little bit. So I highly recommend checking that out if you're a coffee drinker. We are also working on a deal with Bunker Branding to get our merch onto their shop. So stay tuned for that. We have our other channels. The Lore Lodge is obviously the flagship, but we have the History Hut, the Weird Bible, the Lore Lounge, and Aiden Mattis, which is my personal streaming and gaming channel where I do reaction streams, I do gaming streams, I do just chatting kind of things. Uh, you can also check us out on Spotify for the podcast, as well as Apple Music, Amazon Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, all of those. And if you want to check out the podcast live, that goes live at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Sundays. We have some pretty exciting guests scheduled and coming up, so I'm really looking forward to the next few weeks of that. 
And if you want updates on what this channel is up to, the moment new videos drop, things like that, because let's be realistic, YouTube's notifications aren't great, well, uh, you can check out our Discord at bit.ly slash join the lodge, as well as we also recommend if you like our stuff and you want to see it when it comes out, check that notification bell. Last thing I'll say is if you're still watching the video, I'm assuming you liked it, so if you could show the like button some love, we'd appreciate it. All that said, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lord Lodge.